Hi, Indy. Hi, Haley. Hello. Hello. How have you been? Great. <laughs> been sitting across from you singing songs while setting up our garage van to record this beautiful podcast. Yeah, we're trying a new video method. Yeah. Tried something that didn't work for the last episode, so this is true. Here we do a here we go with a new one. Yeah. Video is always hard. Yeah. Especially if you don't have the right tools. Especially audio. Oh god. Audio. But luckily hard. we love this podcast studio. Um we do. today. What are we talking about? Today we're going to continue our actors' financial boot camp and talk about some side hustles that have been helpful to me. Yes. So while I've been here. Yeah, we talked about spending money. Now we're gonna talk about making money. Mm-hmm. If you're not getting to LA and have a job already lined up as an actor, how how do you make money? And you know, Haley hates the word hustle. I don't like the word hustle because it seems like you're killing yourself. For the for the dough. For the dime. How um, do you kill yourself? So Haley, where do we start with this? What should we talk about the red flags of side hustles? What what are the side hustles you would never do again? After how long have you been in LA now? Been in LA four years. How long have you been doing side hustles? Four years. Okay. <laughs> I did not come to Los Angeles with an invitation on a lo- onto a lot. Okay. I didn't I was just a girl. Dream. With a tiny bank account and a dream and a di- fresh divorce. Yeah. So that's, yeah. Yeah, that's another story. <laughs> that's a different day. Yeah. Um. Yeah, so, I mean, there are side hustles that I have done. And when I wanted to stop, when I was ready to stop doing them for an extended period of time, I always said to myself, I will never do that again. And then I do them again. Got it. Because I think every so things run their course, and then you find a way to refresh yourself, and then maybe side hustles are wildly convenient, and so then you find yourself being like, eh, it wasn't so bad, and you do it again. Enough time can help you forget. Uh, like after a breakup, and you forget about all the bad things that happened in that relationship. Time heals all things. Yes. All, what is it? Time heals all wounds. Is that a saying? It can be now if it's not. Time heals all side hustle wounds. Worst mm, maybe side not, hustles. Maybe not all. Yeah. Maybe not all. There. I mean, I'm pretty fresh off of the like set PA side hustle thing. Um, so I am still saying I probably will not do that again. But if it were the right situation, I would probably go back. I would say... Any side hustle, any side hustle is not going to be a long-term thing, which is why they're side hustles, because they're hard, they drain a little bit, and they're hard to stick with. Yeah. And, um, but they're really easy to pick back up when you need a little bit of extra cash. So, something that I quit a long time ago and haven't done, and I mean, maybe won't go back to but I look at it a lot um I keep up with it because it, I don't have like a negative oh your foot pictures I had a really wonderful time selling pictures of my <laughs> <laughs> extra lunch money.com no I have never done that however I am not above that no no I'm, if someone wants to look at my gross feet and Think about them and, you know, do stuff about it. I was approached by a man at a dollar store near my house. Are you serious? I was wearing sandals and he goes, oh, excuse me. I'm like, oh, yeah, what's up? And he's like, what what nail color is that? My wife would love it. I said, I don't know. It's just some red. Some red. And he goes, can I take a photo? And I said, oh, no, no, thank you. And that's weird. And ran away. Probably a good move. Yeah. Very savvy of you to be like, uh, red flag. Yeah. Red. No thanks. I just felt really uncomfortable. My friend and I almost sold our underwear once. I would have said for $700 you can. $700? Um, I would also tr- sell my underwear. I would, I am not above that. Stuff. Right. 
I'll do anything for a dime. Just to, kidding. To an extent. I mean, like, sure. Like, someone wants some underwear, they can have it. I don't, I'll buy more for myself. Yeah. I don't want them to know who I am. No. And, or who and it's coming an, from. Anonymity. An, 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 anonymity. <laughs> Try like again. Finding Nemo. Try again. And then, 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 and Anonymity. <laughs> anonymity. Sounds like I'm starting up a motorcycle. You like adding an extra N to it. It's fun. Anonymity. Anonymity. <laughs> Imagine if you just go. Anonymity. <laughs> you just keep going. And then, you know. Anonymity. Anyway, it's back cool. to selling underwear. Don't uh, do it. Um, it don't can, do it. It's illegal, actually, because you're putting like your biohazard. Yeah, in the mail. <gasps> Okay, yeah, now that I know that's illegal, just don't do it. Da-da-da. Da-da-da. So. Uh, no, never did any of that. Um, I was approached a number of times by someone who knew me asking to sell photos of myself to him. Um, what? And I would not. In L.A.? Yeah. I do I know the person? No. Um, he's actually a, a lovely person. He just ha- has a hard time meeting women, I think, and. I don't know. Also, maybe he's kinky, which is, I don't kink shame. How did you meet him? I, he, we grew up in the same state. So somehow through state, like Utah things. Okay, but that's an entire state. How did you meet? State, I don't know. Like sometimes you just meet someone from Utah. Haley, how did you meet him? I don't know. Online, mate? Like. (laughs) Maybe he, it was like, hey, I see you're from Utah, me too, cool. And then we became friends. Okay. And then how much was he willing to how sell your photos him? for? He may have just slipped into my DMs. Okay. But he's really sweet, kind, like kind and like a friend, and I do not kink shame. And if that's something he's into, that's totally fine. But I'm just not into like selling. How much was it? Probably not very much. We didn't even talk about. You were just numbers. like, I'm good. Yeah, we didn't even talk about numbers because he was like, would you be open to this? And I said, no, thank you. And he said, okay, and we're still friends. You know, like, it's totally fine. But I have not. Maybe I'm an idiot. Maybe I should have. No, you're um, not an idiot. I don't like p- taking naked pictures of myself. That's fair. Because I have some body shame. Well, uh, also because different when day, you get famous, different you day, don't Different day, different issue. I mean... Maybe I get famous because it's leaked. True. Like some people. True. <laughs> uh, but it will never happen because I don't take nudes. Um, you heard it here. You heard it here first. Seal of approval. You'll never get a nude from me because I am still Mormon in many ways. Got it. Um. <laughs> so side hustles that. Side hustles that are actually valid side hustles. One, one side hustle that I did for a, a long time, actually, Um. And burnt out on, but now probably won't go back to it, but no longer have, like, a negative feelings associated with it, is seat filling, which is not as involved as being a background actor, um, and but it also pays a little less, and it's non-union stuff. There are a few um, services that do it that you can like find a way basically what you're doing is you're an audience member so you you go in you're not usually on camera sometimes they do like pop over to you and pop back but usually you're not on camera um you go to a live taping not a live taping of something but a taping of something and you sit in the audience and you are the real laughter or it's a talk show so you're like the real because it's People perform better when they have actual human feedback and human energy. So I did shows like um, Steve, what Steve, I've forgotten. Let's see. I'm just going to read. I'm just going to read because I have it in front of me. Um, 
I did shows like I did Let's Make a Deal. Okay. Uh, one company that did like Wipeout and American Ninja Warrior. Uh, I did The Masked Singer. Uh, Bill Maher. Um, there was a show called The Real. I don't know if that's a thing anymore. What were? Can you talk about some of the rates? The rate I can talk about the rates. Yeah. Um. So the different companies have different rates. So I'll say the company name. Uh, one is Standing Room Only, and they did a lot of like court shows. They also did um, the talent shows like Mass Singer and things like that. Um, their rates were at the time fourteen twenty five an hour. I think they do minimum wage, so it's probably gone up. I haven't done it in about two years. Um, but you work. Three to six hours of work, um, and you're paid for hours worked. So you're not guaranteed any amount of money, um, and you're paid your ten ninety nine for that. Uh, another company is A Plus Audiences. They paid generally a little bit less than Standing Room Only, but they did. It was a lot more fun because they did shows that were like multi cam sitcoms. So I saw like Carol's Second Act and The Connors uh, and Doctor Phil. I did one Doctor Phil show where it was during the pandemic so I was on zoom so like the whole audience was just like a zoom audience and they just like flip through our faces so I did that from home which was really amazing um and they pay 13 25 at the time they paid 13 25 to 16 dollars an hour and again it was just like no guaranteed rate just the hours you work is the hours you're paid for um and they paid uh through like zelle like they just like sent you cash through zelle no 10.99 um BTS, Background Talent Services, was another one. Um, I wasn't registered on that website. Um, they cast a lot through um, LA Casting. So, like, you could find seat-filling jobs through the LA Casting website that most actors have to have anyway. Um, and it, I think that they would guarantee... Uh, they would guarantee a certain number of hours. Um... BTS I wasn't registered on, but I did work once. And they, my fa- my favorite show to work was 25 Words or Less. It's like a game show. Um, but that was really fun because you were you knew you would never be on camera, but, like, everyone was so excited to be there that everyone was super nice. And they would throw candy at you. So I really wow. liked doing that. So basically there are a lot of seat-filling services, and you get to go be on a lot. You get to go see how shows are made and how things run kind of from the sidelines. And then they pay you a little cash to do it. So if you have nothing else going on, you're brand new in town, that's a really good way to, like, meet some other people and ask them what they're doing on the side. That was kind of, like, the general conversation that people would have. Everyone was pretty new and everyone was talking about, like, oh, my God, what are you doing? Like, how are you making ends meet right now? So it's a really great way to, like, just like kind of get your like first little introduction um one step up from that is background acting um which I did for like two whole years okay um I will still do it from time to time I don't do it as regularly anymore because I don't have you have to have quite a bit of availability to make that work and I just don't anymore um but that's great because you can get your SAG card that way uh which is what happened to me uh and I worked on many shows but background acting you can either find jobs yourself there are a few different services but the most reputable and like heavily like saturated one is central casting um I don't know what the registration uh, situation is now they may have an online way to do it uh, but when I moved here you had to get there at five o'clock in the morning at the central casting office and line up and the first 50 people in line were invited in that day um so it it would be like a line around to the do block. what so you would go in and sit in the chairs that you fit into and they would basically talk you through basically like what a day is like as a background actor and then they would talk you through like the paperwork you were going to fill out they would give you like a packet to fill out the paperwork and then they would 
tell you like how you respond. They, they send text messages to ask if you're available or how you could submit yourself on their website for things. Um, and the numbers you needed to call. Um, it's a lot of information at first, but it all ends up making a lot of sense in the end. Uh, and the longer you do it, the more Is comfortable this where you, you were making additional money for special skills and stuff? Yes. Oh, got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So you get registered, you fill out the paperwork, and then they take your picture. Um, now everything's online. Like, I just upload pictures now when my look changes. Um, actually, I'm not very good at doing that. I need to do that some more. Um, but basically, then they reach out and ask you if you're available to work on the show. They ask you, like, you can sign up with your car. So they ask you if you they can use your car that day. And you come and you get paid for the day. But then you also get paid another hourly rate for your car or for, like, your special skill. Like, I did ice skating a few times and I got paid extra because I could ice like what like give us a range I think for something like special skills is like 15 to 35 dollars an hour if I'm remembering correctly uh there are non-union and union background actors okay Uh, so when you're non-union you make less money Mm -hmm. you generally work big cattle calls which are like over a hundred people and they te- it tends to be like a you bit said rougher. that's a nightmare. It's a hard day. It's a really hard day because you get there and you're like, I have I went to drama school, and then you're like not even on the show. Like you are like to be really honest and brutal about it, you are a moving prop. You don't talk. You mime. If you say if you make sound, you get in trouble. They put you in holding, which uh, I've heard when I started working as a PA, I heard PAs and production people making jokes about background actors being like their cattle, like put down some fresh hay for them. Like when you bring them to set, put down some fresh hay so that they can like, so like, this is horrible. Yes, but it's just like how it is. Like, it sucks but background actors can be irritating and what would you make after a day of background hi everyone it's indiana just popping in here to chat a little bit about cinematography for actors it's an online course platform that Haley and i created to teach the technical side of performance As a cinematographer, I've noticed that the difference between newer and seasoned actors isn't in their ability to perform, it's in their ability to understand the technical requirements of them on set. Our goal is to help you, as an actor or a newer filmmaker, feel confident when you walk onto set. We release new classes monthly, and you'll also find tons of free downloadable content. Now, we recommend the most affordable option, our subscription, where you'll have access to every single thing we put out, including bonus materials, existing classes, and classes as they release monthly. Our listeners can use code TTC Podcast for 20% off a monthly membership of the entire collection. That's TTC Podcast for 20% off your car to check out. Okay, back to the episode. I think the rates now for non-union background acting, it's 117 for eight hours. And you usually shoot longer than in eight hours. So you make, then you start making like time and a half and then you make double time. And then if you're there for like more than 16 hours, you make golden time, which is beautiful because uh, it's your entire day rate over again. Um, but union actors... Uh, you tend to work smaller in smaller groups and they there are fewer of you so they have time to treat you a little bit better on set unfortunately the realistically having worked on both sides I understand that like there is usually one or two PAs in charge of all the background actors oh my god so I mean if there are hundreds of background actors they'll bring in extra PAs but those PAs are just day players like they don't 
technically know they are not part of the show either they don't really know like who the people are what's they're just there to just like kind of corral you and like hope they get you to the right place it's so crazy to me that when I'm like working on set we have like background sometimes Mm -hmm. and I don't even think about like their day like I just see them and I'm like let's get a shot of that let's get a shot of this like hey do you mind if I touch you can I move you like this way towards camera and like all this stuff but it's just so interesting that then there's like just these like PAs assigned to them that yeah. escort them all. Like I don't even think about it. They just get brought in and I'm like, great, let's shoot this coverage, get a reaction, get that, whatever. Yeah. yeah. They're pro- like moving props kind of, which is, it's hard yeah. as an actor because most of these background actors who live here are classically trained actors. Did I look nuts? What? No, that's just crazy oh, to me. I thought you were telling me I looked crazy. No, like classically, classically trained actors who yeah. probably have MFAs from like Yale. Like like everyone does it because they have to make some money and it's a good way to get on set time and also have some flexibility. Yeah. So um and the money's pretty good once you're a side actor. But yeah, like these PAs also something kind of fucked up. PAs make less money generally than SAG background actors do. So there's a little bit of like Yeah, because 184 versus what? Like 175? 115 sometimes. What? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it depends on the day. But yeah, it depends on the day in the show. But um, yeah, when I was a PA, I was making a lot less than I made as a background actor. But PAs work every day unless they're day players. And are treated with some respect, I imagine. Treated with some respect. To some extent, maybe. To some, to some extent. And yeah, so... It's just like the bottom of the call sheet is leading the other bottom of the call sheet around. And it's hard for everybody. Um, Background actor, after being a PA, I was like, hell yeah, I am going back to background acting and never leaving again. And when I left background acting, I was like, I probably won't do this ever again because I wasn't, I was on a show that I'd been working on pretty regularly for a couple of seasons and I enjoyed it. But that last day I was like cold and kind of miserable. And I was like, I am still just like, scrape in the bottom of the barrel and I really am not having fun so I quit and decided to work as a PA and like now my whole mind like my mindset has flipped you know like I'm going to go be a background actor and I'm not like a trained actor that day I'm just gonna go read my book you You know know, like it's different um but it is hard it's hard when you first get here and all you want is to like act so bad like you just you see the actors on set doing their lines and you're like I would be ready for this there was one particular job I worked where one of the actors was having like a hard time like wasn't prepared was like had a bad attitude and the whole crew was like visibly frustrated and like you could hear them like talking shit And I was so frustrated. I'm sure many of us were so frustrated because we're trained actors sitting in, you know, corralled in background holding. The day is stretching out because this actor isn't prepared. And we're all like, we would be ready for this. Like, we would be, we don't know. We don't know what kind of life or day this actor's had. We don't know anything about them. All we know is they showed up on set and they weren't prepared and they weren't respecting the job that we're all just dying to have right. that we would have showed up and been professional you know like Oof, that vibe like, must be it's yeah it's kind of a shitty vibe which is why they keep us very separate <laughs> from the actors oh, man. to be honest because there would probably be there have been actually ooh i want to tell a story okay i know we're talking about side hustles but i have a little tell story us. um about a act a background actor with a very bad attitude ooh Um, Because that happens. We're not, like, background actors are sometimes assholes, too. Yeah. Um, Sometimes more so. Uh, This actor, it was on that show that I worked a lot on. And there were a bunch of guest stars in for the day. Uh, Not leads, but they were recurring. And they were, I guess that's not guest stars. That's a recurring character. A bunch of recurrings were there that day. And they were, like, this is the first time they'd seen each other in a while, so they were, like, kind of dicking around a little bit. And But it was, like, clear they were, like, ready to do the scene when it was time. But there was this one guy who got sat next to me, and he was, like, reading a, like, play all day and kept 
like and to anyone who would listen he'd be like i detest doing background work it's so beneath and me. why like, are you there he had just come off of he'd had a series regular on something that didn't get that got picked up but he didn't get picked up probably because of his bad attitude um but he just had a series regular so he was like i'm better than everyone here and like you're of, not if you're doing the I same mean, like, job a lot as of the background else. actors were like okay dude you know like yeah. just kind of left him alone um but we were sitting next to each other so i was like just like kind of like dealing with it and then one of the recurrings sat right in front of us and they like got into a like argument like he was like hey buddy like the recurring or the background? And the background with the shitty attitude. I just remember the feeling of all the background being like, dude, like, you can't talk to him like that. Like, you can't, like, you shouldn't talk to him anyway. But, like, he instigated it. So awkward because he was basically saying to the recurring actor, like, you're not good enough to be here. Oh, my God. And the actor kept just like turning around being like okay man but he just like get it like i was afraid they were going to physically fight each other whoa and then this kid was like he's like he was like frustrated because the kid was like because the recurring guy was like not taking it the day seriously basically i guess so i mean he was doing it he was doing that in his own way i'm sure like he was ready to shoot but he like didn't like that he was like talking in between takes crazy which they can do whatever they want between takes so background acting is kind of great because you're staying within the world of film and you're seeing how Mm -hmm. things happen and how movies are made which if you're new to yeah long term it can be very um did you pay your rent with the amount of money you were making just barely got it because unless you're uh carried on a show which means that you're like regular background your core is what they call you um you don't make you're you're not it's not regular enough okay but if you're core that's a problem because then you don't have flexibility for your own acting Mm. so it's you know double-edged sword um also in that same vein is stand-in work which pays a little bit more and how do you get that by being there enough that someone trusts you to try standing in once and then once you have experience then you put it on your it's like a hierarchy thing it's basically yeah like they've someone saw you do it so they request you again or you put on your profile that you've done it so they ask you to come in you basically become a stand-in by having the exact height weight coloring as one of the actors on the show great um so pretty pretty good news if you've got that um and that's a that's a pretty sweet gig because then you almost feel like you're part of the crew. Like the crew will talk to you more. The PAs trust you because if you're there being a stand-in, you've been there long enough to know how things work. They don't need to babysit you as, as much. You know when you need to go in and stand and when you walk out. So you kind of are left alone. You run your day by yourself um, and the crew will chat to you. So... And then if you're a regular stand-in, a utility stand-in, that's an AD will call Central Casting and try to book you for the entire season. Mm. Uh, That's a pretty great deal. Okay. But again, if you want to go on auditions and you want to book shows, there's not a lot of flexibility unless you're hired by a really cool AD who understands that, which is a possibility, but it's pretty rare. Okay. Um, Usually long-running shows will have the same stand-ins every season. And those stand-ins have built a relationship with the AD to be able to step out and come back as kind of as needed. Um, but that's kind of a coveted position. And, and you, then you are a professional stand-in. You are less, you're not so much acting anymore. And what kind of money does that bring in? I think that's 204 a day. Okay the current rates okay i haven't done it in like a number of months so one more lunch the minimum wage changed since the last time i was on set as a background actor or as a stand-in uh but yeah stand-in if you can get a day as like a 
day playing stand in. So it's a really good day. Okay. It's a great day. Cool. Super fun. So these are side hustles in film. In film. What about outside of film? Outside of film, um, you can, things that you can pick up really without anyone, anyone needing to help you. You can do things like Uber Eats deliveries or, um, yeah, like the apps, basically. The what? gig economy apps. And what about, can you talk about how you got your job doing screenings this time of the year? Yeah. I want to talk about it with the note that it's not just, like, widely available to anyone. No, but what's available Yeah, if you, you know, form the relationships? You have to make the relationships again. Um, I guess you could also kind of just, like, email PR companies and ask if they need screening staffers. Yeah. Uh, the so screening staffer is what it's called. Screening staffers is what it's called. Uh, from October to through almost April until the Oscars, basically some Emmys, but not very much. There is a campaign season in Hollywood. I don't know if I'm allowed to talk about. <laughs> I am shattering an illusion right now. This may no. It's why I, it's widely you. known on my end of things. Okay. Uh, I don't know if it's publicly known widely. Uh, yeah. People campaign for their awards. Yeah. You don't just, like, get nominated and get an award. Maybe this There's is how... There's press, Q&As, multiple screenings. They invite editors of magazines. They invite all press outlets, mm-hmm. and they pay a ton of money for it. Yeah. Um. So I work for a PR company that runs certain campaigns for certain Freelance. Films. I work freelance as a screening staffer. So... Uh, they reach out to me a couple times a week and say, hey, are you available this night for this screening? And I say yes or no. And it doesn't, you know, I don't get penalized if I'm not available. Um, and then I go to a screening and I sometimes I will check the guests in using an app or a list. Sometimes I'm not responsible for that. Um, and then I sit through the movie and sometimes there's a Q&A afterward with the actors and the creators of the film. And then free food and drinks. And then sometimes there's a reception afterwards, which has free food and drinks, which I am allowed to partake in if I want. I usually don't because after the film, so throughout the film, I've made um, notes on reactions. So like if people laughed, if I saw people crying, if someone got up and left, I make notes of all of that in a notebook. And then I note the time that it actually started and I take a little picture of there's a QA. and a and then I have to write a report that I send to the production company. Well, oh. I send my report to the PR company, and then they tweak it to make it sound the way they want it to. And then they send it to the production company. Um, just kind of saying how the screening went and what we think, you know, if it was successful or not. Um, so I usually don't stick around very long at the reception I kind of stick around an eavesdrop to listen because I have to put some quotes in at the end oh. of, of like what people said they liked about it and stuff but and what's the rate uh what does it range so when I started a few years ago they offered twenty dollars an hour okay um for the screening and then you also get paid for the report as, cool. well, as well um I make more than that but I'm not that's fine uh, at liberty to say in case, but 20, in case other staffers are listening. 20 was the control. starter, and then yeah. what? And then you would get paid an hourly for the report? Uh, I think at the, it changes every year the way they pay it. Um, For the report, it was a flat fee for the report. Because okay. the report sometimes takes an hour and a half. Sometimes it takes... I find that at the beginning of the season, my reports take a lot longer because I haven't seen the film before. But once I start to like understand where... The reactions are they're usually in similar places my report doesn't take as long to Got write it. so if my report takes 15 minutes I still want to get they still pay the same amount of money um I remember running it was so funny last year around this time um I'm friends with some of my oldest friends in this industry are like editors and journalists and um and so I come with them to some of the the, the award season screenings and I remember running into our friend Doug at the San Vicente bungalows mm-hmm. for, um, for like a dock, and it was just like so funny how small the world is because like we could be friends with people, but it's like you don't know you their don't every know. move. And then I literally showed up and was late and like ran to the door, and my friend was meeting me there, and he was 
and I, he was like, hello. And I was like, oh, Jesus. <laughs> it was like one of my best <laughs> friends. And I was like, oh, God damn, that's awesome. I just love how small this industry is. And I'm always yeah. reminded of it. And especially at these like screenings, you always run into really great people. Yeah. Um, so that's a fun hustle to have. I forgot to mention that's how I got that. Through Doug. Through Doug, yeah. Um, Doug worked for them in a different capacity for a year and then decided he wanted to be a screener again, screening staffer again, and then told them about me, and that's how I got it. Oh, but fun. every year they ask me for like to send them names and info of people who might be interested wow. because they're always looking for more screening staffers. And I'm sure there are other PR companies that also need screening staffers. So... As much as that was like a kind of like a secret and hidden gig to me, I don't think it's actually as secret as it seemed. Like I didn't need to know someone to get that job. You could probably send an email and they need it and be like, hey, uh, I'm good at writing. Like they probably ask for a writing sample or something. Um, Another side hustle I do is. I babysit dogs. Oh, yeah. I'm a professional vacation home and dog sitter. Great. Which is great because Which I, pays well, too. Pays pretty well. I live at a person's house while they're gone and watch their dog and water their plants and make sure their home is safe and that their animals are happy when they return home. Um, and kind of, I don't know, I feel like it's a study in empathy a little bit to kind of understand how people live. Nice. Um and I just, I don't know, something about caring for somebody's home and pet that they love so much is very, feels very meaningful to me. And what's like the range of rates on that? Uh, Starting out. I've seen people getting paid like $17 an hour for a walk. And then some people for like overnights get paid like 150 it's generally more expensive than if someone put their animal in a dog hotel because it's you know one-on-one you're living in their house you're caring for kind of like their you're just kind of their lifestyle you're stepping into their life a little bit as far as their pet is concerned um so it's a little bit more of like a personalized experience which is why it's a little more expensive um personalized experience yeah it's a very personalized Mm because it's their house um uh yeah so I do that and that just happened because one of my friends told someone that I would do it for them and now you have glowing reviews and then they tell you know they tell people because everyone has a dog here and yeah you can get someone from like wag or something but if someone else knows them personally there's a little bit more trust there uh it also can cost nothing if you're just looking for a place to stay. There's a website called Trusted House Sitters, and you basically just stay in their home for free, so you're not paying for rent. Like, if you're on vacation or if you're just moving to L.A., it's a good way to, like, kind of find... Take your two weeks. Where and, you yeah. like, like, what your neighborhoods are like before you, like, settle down Smart. or find something. Because it doesn't cost you anything, and it also doesn't cost them anything. And that's, like, background checked and stuff. Um, I've never personally done it, but I think it would be a cool way to travel. That's cool. Yeah. Um, what are some other... Quick like little things you do. We audition. I do we audition. Um, we audition is great. You can work as a reader yeah. and make you kind of set your own prices. You can just read with people for auditions or you can help people prepare for an audition and memorize. Or there are also people who coach on that website as well. And people set their own rates and or no rates and people tip you for that. And that's kind of cool. Um, there used to be a lot of like, in office, in casting office reading that went on. Um, I don't think that happens as much because it's not in person anymore, and I think that they've kind of figured out actors will do it for free, so they're not Mm. paying anymore. Yeah. Um, I mean, I was a set PA for a long time. Uh, That can be a side hustle if you do it for, like, I would suggest looking for PA gigs in the photo world um, because those are generally shorter days. It's a smaller crew. um, It's not a running show, so you won't get stuck feeling like you have to come back for months on end. You can kind of take a day here and take a day there. If you were living off side hustles, 
how much do you think you could afford to like what can you live off of a month like what what can you expect while trying to pursue acting what are you bringing in a month without something like like it's it's freelance it's all freelance yeah in the beginning when I was working off of side hustles um I was covering my bills I was also living much cheaper so I think I was making at the time uh when I was a non-union background actor uh and so I was making less money there I was doing a lot of seat filling I wasn't driving uber yet I didn't start driving uh uber eats until the pandemic uh, so I don't know about that, but I was making about twenty five hundred dollars a month, okay. piecing together, which side is hustles. like a lot of work because you're finding the jobs as well as getting yeah. them, and yeah. it's not like a guaranteed amount, right? But it's so flexible. That's cool. So the longer you're in a place and people know you're looking to make side money, wow, meet people, the and more form authentic people, relationships. the more people will point you in the right direction to make side what money. We're always saying. It's hard to make side money, just landing somewhere and immediately yeah. doing everything yourself. Also artistically working side hustles and gigs is great because you're getting a bunch of different experiences. Life experience. Yeah. If you move to LA and you work as a waiter, your experience and an actor your experience as a, as a waiter and an actor. This is a good point because they always talk to DPs and directors and producers, writers, whoever, in film, and they always say, like, your stories will be informed by the life experience mm-hmm. that you have had. Yeah. And it doesn't mean you have to travel to 30 countries to get that life experience. Yeah. It can be just meeting people through the different things that we just talked about. It mm-hmm. could be the hard work and ethic and empathy built from different people's living situations or the different jobs that you're doing, all that stuff. So that's a great point, Haley. Yeah. More more to draw from. I think everything you've described and have gone through is like a really easy way of working in LA for side hustle money. Like Mm -hmm. PA work, it's everywhere. Go on Staff Me Up, go on Craigslist, go on Mandy, go on Mm -hmm. whatever meet people they'll be like you know I recommend people as PAs all the time and I'm not even in that like I just like to I'm camera world but I know that I have a shoot coming up and they probably need a PA and if I like you and I want you around like Haley I asked on a recent film I shot I was like are you in town do you want to come make I think we were paying the PAs like 225 or something heck yeah and she was like I'm in Mexico but next time (laughs) I just because I want her around and you know, we work with people we like. And so all of the stuff you've said is a real good example of that. It's like from staffing the screenings to PA work to background to building relationships enough to be a stand-in. All of that stuff all has to do with having good relationships and can backfire if you don't have a good attitude. And especially the house sitting. I mean, even if you're not in film, the house sitting, the dog sitting, that's trust. That's forming good relationships. It's empathy. It's Every single, I feel like every single time we talk, we're talking about building authentic relationships. And I think driving that to an audience like yourselves is is a huge part of the LA mentality. And I mean, I'd hope being a good person mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, but it really goes a long way here. Yeah. I will say that um, I have worked in a restaurant. Yes. And kind of just like the, I don't know, like, Actors are always, like, talking about how, like, you got to be a waiter. Like, you got to ser- be a server. And that, like, there's quite a bit of money that comes with that if you're working in the right place. However, I have personally found that serving and working in a restaurant is very restrictive. And it wasn't great your for schedule. your mental health, too, right? It wasn't great for my mental health, uh which may have just been the restaurant I was in. Um, I felt like a lot of the people who were creatives who had who moved here and started working in that restaurant, it's not that they'd given up, but they had put too much of their energy into working at the restaurant and didn't feel like they could or had time or had the energy to pursue, pursue yeah, their, their dream their career that they yeah. wanted and I feel like that happens often so I was just surrounded by a bunch of people who were like well I can't 
-hmm. and just kind of it didn't feel like the right kind of situation like you kind of you, it's hard enough to like keep yourself motivated yeah but also on top of that most restaurants don't release your schedule more than two weeks in advance hard to work and film like that yeah and also it's restrictive because you have a shift yeah you have a shift and regardless of what the restaurant says about being supportive, yeah. they only, it's a business. They will only schedule the exact amount of people they need to run that restaurant. So if you get an audition or you get a co-star and you have to be there the next day and you can't find someone to cover your shift. First of all, you have to find someone to cover your shift. And likely... The other people you work with are exhausted and don't want to come in and work a double for you. Yeah. As much as it would be beautiful if we all understood that everyone's trying to be an actor here and we no. would cover for each other. Some people cover for everyone and then when they need the time off, no one will cover for them. Like you, probably. You were probably pretty good at covering people. That is true. That's what happened. <laughs> Just knowing your personality. That's yeah. what happened. I was working a lot of doubles for a lot of people, and then <laughs> they would be like, oh, I'm already working that day. Yeah. And I would be like, dude, I worked a double for you three times last week. Like, oh can God. you please? Um, anyway, but it's, I don't think it's ideal. I honestly would love to be like, yes, you'll make the most money that way. You should do that. If you don't show up for your shift, the restaurant is screwed. And your coworkers are screwed. Yeah. They're busy. You're carrying guilt with you. They're angry at you. You'll make le you're gonna make less money doing these side hustles. You are. But you're also going to feel like you're letting fewer people down. And, and I want freedom. Personally for me, letting people down is the worst fear. And so I would give more of my loyalty to a sh like a job that's shift work and like being like, I'll show up on time for my shift. Than I would to my my own career and my own happiness. You've and that never may, let it me may down. Not, it may not be that way for everyone, but for some people, working as a server in a restaurant may not be the right approach when they're trying to be an actor and need that flexibility because it's not flexible. Great. And on that, that's why we talked side hustles. That's because why I talked to side there is a world that exists. Outside of the traditional waiter, server, host, all of the shift work. Mm -hmm. And I think the idea, I think there's an argument a lot of the time about staying within film or staying outside of film or like, do you work in it? Do you not work in it? If it's not like your chosen profession, should I work in it? Because then people are only seeing me as that. Mm -hmm. However, luckily, I think actors have it on their side that it is like expected that a lot of you know, trained actors are doing background, are doing, like, staying in that mentality, mm -hmm. in that headspace. So I think if it allows you to form relationships even with surrounding background or with one AD, mm -hmm. that's a huge deal. Um, so so that's great. Thank you so much for sharing and being so transparent, Haley. You're welcome. Yeah. And, um, and this was, this is great. I'm glad that we could cover two episodes of the what we'll call the LA Actors Financial Boot Camp. Financial Boot Camp. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>